In one of the videos, you say the only solution is for Israel to annex the Gaza Strip and kill enough sons of bitches to make sure this isn't a problem again. You say anyone who calls for a ceasefire is a terrorist sympathizer. I want you to think about how sick and demented that is. How sick and demented that is. The case that you, none of your colleagues or you, have been able to offer one single condolence, one single condemnation, one single word of sympathy. Whether they will have power, whether they will have clean water, whether they will have medicine. When you occupy a people for decades, and I say that as someone who is Jewish, I'm a Jewish. Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Welcome to the Dean Shah, I'm Eddie, your host. Thank you for tuning in. It's good to see you guys. Excited to have my next guest, Dr. Omar Suleiman, an imam out of Texas, a person who's very well acquainted with what's happening in Palestine. Ultimately, one of the things that I think people need to remember is that if you live in Gaza, and I was reporting there for many years and have spent time there since in the last 15 or so years, for the majority of Palestinians there, there's two and a half million of them roughly. It's a blockade imposed by Israel and Egypt. And that means basically you don't have friendly of movement you can't leave when you want you can't say study outside the country very easily and that's suffocating and this is not a defense of hamas by any means i've spent time with hamas as a reporter in gaza and many gazans i know don't like hamas particularly in the past or now but the truth is that when you occupy a people for decades and i say that as someone who is jewish i'm a jewish german australian and I've reported on this issue for 20 or so years, and I am surprised by obviously the timing of this, but at the same time, not at all surprised by the reasons behind it. That somehow there's a belief that you can lock people up, occupy them, and of course, let's not forget, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and others have called what's happening in Palestine apartheid. That's their words. Mm. Every Israeli human rights organization has called it apartheid. If that is the case for years, and it is, and I've reported on that myself, as other, have other journalists, eventually people will snap. People will break. You cannot continue to behave like this as a Jewish state, a, a self-described moral state, and expect Palestinians simply to lie down and accept it. When you occupy a people for that long, look, I don't accept and, and, and support the idea of taking civilian hostages at all. Condemn it 110%. I'm not defending that at all. But it's used as a bargaining chip. You see, one of the problems so much, and I've having reported about this for so long, is it's the framing here that we can get outraged in the West about the taking of civilians back into Gaza. Fine. But there's far less outrage about the fact that every day this year and for every year for decades, Palestinian civilians are killed in the West Bank and Gaza. They are killed by Israeli forces. That gets far less international outrage. Now, they're both wrong. Killing civilians is always wrong, regardless of who does it and where. But ultimately, to me, I think that double stand in so much how we as journalists report this is, in my view, a big part of the problem. In what the UN calls the unlawful and illegal occupation under international law. But to get us more informed, for those who are kind of in the gray zone, they hear this term often, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's just a conflict. we got so many conflicts going on in the world. What's the big deal with this? And that's going to be my first question to my guest. Is this, is this term, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is this a fair and accurate way to frame this issue amongst so many other questions that I'm sure you guys have? I'll be trying to ask, ask him for you guys and get his reaction to these with my next guest. Let's bring him on out. This is the Dean Show. Well, I love you very much. I love all the work that you're doing. When I was ready to talk about it, I would only talk to you. And I was explaining how much respect I have for the faith of Islam. Welcome to the Dean Show. The Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Greetings of peace. How are you doing, Dr. Omar? Alhamdulillah, Yari. How are you? Good, Alhamdulillah. You already heard my first question. I yes, put it sir. out there. Did you get to yes, hear I that? Did. Yeah. I did. I did, yeah. Um, I think that one of the main problems with the framing of this is that it intentionally sort of puts this on, you know, equal power dynamics. So you got two equal opposing armies. You've got two equal opposing nations. You've got two... Um, you know, peoples that have been at it for, for centuries. And, and one of the things that Israeli propaganda takes advantage of, and honestly, American propaganda, which is, which, an ex, which is basically an extension of Israeli propaganda, 
is that the public uh, usually doesn't read beyond the headline. And so it's hit people with these outrageous headlines without fact checking, um, emotional exploitation, and then sort of spin the, 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 the entire crisis as, oh, these are just, you know, two peoples that have been fighting for thousands of years. We're not going to solve it now. The reality is, is that um, this is not a religious, uh, you know, conflict spanning thousands and thousands of years. It's not like people have been fighting Muslims and Jews all this time over this land for thousands and thousands of years. This is an illegal occupation that was an extension of European colonization of the land of Palestine, 1948. And since then, you've had a global refugee crisis. Since then, you've had an expanding illegal occupation. If you put up a map and you went and you showed the expulsion of Palestinians from their homes from 1948 until today, there has never been a period in which that has stopped. And in that process, Palestinians have been killed. Their movement has been further restricted. They're stateless people. If you're in Gaza in particular, 60% of the population of, of Gaza of Gaza are actually refugees. They were expelled from other parts of Palestine into Gaza. So I have relatives in Gaza that I've never even met. They were expelled from different parts of Palestine, put into this open air prison, one of the most densely populated areas in the world with all freedom of movement restricted, being bombarded routinely with the most sophisticated weaponry in the world, shut off from all sides. And, you know, the daily incursions, the daily aggressions against the people of Gaza and the people of Palestine as a whole go completely ignored by the American media. So something as simple as, you know, Gaza's seaports constantly uh, restricted. The only way that people can eat when they are shut off from all the different directions in terms of land is they're fishing. And so routinely you'll have that radius shut down to where you know, you can no longer fish 11 miles out. Now it's seven miles. Now it's five miles. The restriction of movement, the destruction of the hospital infrastructure, the bombing of the Egyptian border, which has been closed on the people of Palestine. And so if you're if you're an American and you're watching the news and you're hearing, um, you know, Netanyahu just saying all innocent Palestinians or all Palestinian civilians, he never uses the word innocent, of course, civilians in Gaza, uh, we're warning you to leave. Leave where? Leave where? You're in this tiny place. And the the only hope that you have is that the bombing does not hit your residential building. And the only calculation that you could possibly make is, do I go next door or not? Do, do I trust that, you know, based upon whatever randomness I can decipher from these bombings, is it going to be, you know, uh, my cousin's uh, building or is it going to be my building next? And this is, of course, ignoring the settler violence. This is ignoring the apartheid system that has been imposed on the Palestinians, a legal system or an illegal system through legal terminology classed as apartheid by international consensus now. So it's not a conflict. You don't have two peoples, two states, two nations on equal footing. You have an occupier and an occupy. You have a colonizer and you have a colonized. And all of that is important context. And what the you know, the, the propaganda is doing is it's not just selling you a lie about what's happening now. It's completely intentionally ignoring the past so that people can be emotionally exploited as these war crimes play out in real time right in front of our eyes. You mentioned the word apartheid. I want you to break this down for some people. I haven't even heard this word. We heard we, we hear this a lot. And is this considered also under international law? This is a crime. Israelis rule over Palestinians has been described as this also by the South African freedom advocate and icon Desmond Tutu. You also have this being also put out by U.S. President Jimmy Carter calling this an apartheid. I don't think anyone could go to the West Bank and Gaza or even to East Jerusalem and see what's happening now to the Palestinians that would disagree with my use of the word apartheid. And you also had two leading human rights organizations. Yes, Teen and Bestium, amongst others. So the question is, why is this term apartheid appropriate for this? And what does that mean, apartheid, for the average person? It's just apartheid. What, what, what does that mean? Two separate laws for two separate peoples. You have one set of people that live under an entirely different set of restrictions. They live literally behind an apartheid wall. Uh, every single element of a Palestinian's life is controlled by their occupier. 
they do not have equal right to any form of political participation and they are completely shut out from being able to control their own daily needs and 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 you know live like decent dignified normal human beings i actually encourage people because people don't read anymore to go read the amnesty report on apartheid the human rights watch report on apartheid and actually go through the way that that legal determination was made because it is that important every single south african apartheid activist starting not just with desmond tutu but nelson mandela himself has said that what is being done to the palestinians is in many ways even worse than what has been done to the, the to, to black people in South Africa. He said it's worse. Apartheid. He said this is Nelson Mandela. He was saying this is worse. Desmond Tutu actually went to the territories and came back and said, in many ways, this is worse. Nelson wow. Mandela says our freedom is incomplete until the Palestinians realize their freedom. So there's a deliberate misinformation campaign, again, about the present. There is a, uh, a deliberate exploitation of the overall ignorance that people have of what takes place on a daily basis because they are intentionally kept in the dark. You don't see the daily aggressions against the Palestinian people on any mainstream outlet. I mean, Gaza is being bombed right now, brutally. People are being slaughtered in the dark, and that's not even making it to the mainstream press. What do you think about the daily incursions on Masjid al-Aqsa and the settlers burning homes and attacking people and lynching people and you know just the everyday humiliation of occupation? If that if if right now Gaza is not on your screen, then how is that going to be on your screen? And so there is a deliberate exploitation, again, of people's overall ignorance of what's taking place on a regular basis. And it's playing on people's emotions. You know, we you, you just saw the entire disinformation campaign that the president himself, the president himself repeated a hoax. Uh, the reporting by uh, one Israeli TV channel that 40 babies were murdered by Hamas, including being beheaded, uh, makes a number of the front pages. We have asked on three occasions uh, the IDF to confirm. They have not confirmed this reporting. If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed. I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. <laughs> it's, it's like About 40 beheaded uh, children. What about the 400 plus children in Gaza now that are confirmed dead? That's not a hoax. They're not just decapitated. They're finding legs in some places, arms in some places. I mean, these people are being bombed by American bombs. And that's not a hoax. And the president of the United States could not even say a word of sympathy, you know, about Palestinian life. So uh, this is... This is the most blatant hypocrisy that I think we've seen in a very long time in regards to what is happening uh, to the Palestinian people. It resembles very much the, the racist Islamophobic uh, framings that, that uh, we have been subjected to, especially in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. You know, we're being portrayed as the Arab savages who are bloodthirsty and cannot but be governed by brutality. And so the only way to deal with these, you know, bloodthirsty Arab Muslims is to mow the lawn, is to carpet bomb them. Ted Cruz said, turn it into a parking lot. Netanyahu uh, is told by Jordan Peterson, give them hell. Uh, Nikki Haley says, finish them, right? And, and I'm probably confusing at this point now who said what, but it's just disgusting talking points from the right and from the left that are not even veiling the fact that they don't view Palestinians as full human beings and they're playing to that imagination that these people are bloodthirsty. The only way you can deal with them is put them in this tiny piece of land, shut off the water, shut off the electricity, shut off the hospital system, shut off the fuel, starve them to death and bomb them with the most sophisticated weaponry that exists in the world today. Targeted attacks on civilian infrastructure with a clear aim to cut off men, women, children of water, electricity and heating with the winter coming. These are acts of pure terror and we have to call it as such. I want you to think about how sick and demented that is, how sick and demented that is, right? And the irony of it is that it's being done in the name of protecting human life. 
That's the irony of it all. This is how you protect lives. So clearly, you don't view all human life as equal. So at least be open about your hypocrisy, at least be open about your double standards and stop going about it in these two different ways and and, and just, you know, repeating these horrific uh, tropes about Arabs and Muslims as if they're innocent. Well, I have a lot of questions you mentioned, and I'll get to this, the settler situation, the illegal settlements. Um, you mentioned now the cutting off of food, basic food, water, you know, the survival for life. So many questions, and I want to get this in a short amount of time we have together. Uh, but first, I want to get into. Yeah, I want to apologize, Eddie. I'm, I'm jumping. I'm jumping from place. No, to place. no. But yeah. Honestly, this has been a very. I'll be very real with you, um, and I think it's important. Yes. We're not sleeping. Mm. We're not sleeping because we have relatives. We have people in Gaza that are cut off right now, and every morning you're waiting to hear if they're alive or not. Wow. And. Mm -hmm. While we're not sleeping, we know they're not sleeping. Uh, now, what we're dealing with is nothing compared to what they're dealing with. The sad thing is that, you know, to, to see in these moments that, you know, we have to fight not just Israeli propaganda, but the full thrust of propaganda here at home, the political establishment, the media establishment, your brands, your celebrities, your influencers, it is absolutely exhausting. You know, what's mm -hmm. happening with people at work, you've got now state governments, uh, like Texas just put out some sort of a, a warrant or creating uh, some sort of a division. I don't even know what it's called, but to monitor, uh, you know, and surveil uh, pro-Palestinian, um, you know, protests and report uh, concerning behavior. Uh, so this is, if, if it seems like we're scattered right now and we're jumping from place to place, mm -hmm. And we're outraged because we are, we actually are outraged and we don't, you know, we don't even know where to start when talking to people because the depth of ignorance and media manipulation is just that strong right now. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me this. Uh, recently, there was a tweet that went out where Jordan Peterson, he tweeted, give him hell. And this is kind of people were shocked because it's kind of we've never heard you to tell someone to go to hell. So can you tell us the, uh, and I did a program on this. Can you go ahead oh. and let us know what was the, obviously we can see the buildup to it. And can you go ahead and uh, elaborate on this? Well, look, um, I think it's important to recognize and, and, you know, every Tuesday night I do uh, a class called the firsts uh, where I go through the lives of the Sahaba. And it just so happened we had just finished the, um, the classes about Khubayb radiallahu anhu and Asim radiallahu anhu and many of the, the shuhada of what's known as Bi'r Ma'una and Haditha al rajir two massacres that happened right in the aftermath of Uhud where more people actually died or were killed, martyred in those two massacres in the immediate aftermath of Uhud than Uhud itself. There were more shuhada from those two massacres than Uhud itself. And it was complete betrayal, ambassadors being killed, people that were guaranteed safety that were ambushed and killed. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua against those murderers in every single salah, five prayers for a month. <clears throat> I want you to imagine walking into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, every single salah for an entire month, the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands and he made dua against those people. Now, we know when the Prophet ﷺ himself had his teeth knocked out in Uhud and was, was almost killed, he said, Allah li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive my people, they don't know any better. The point is, is that the Prophet ﷺ did make dua against oppressors. He made dua for the guidance of even his worst enemies and people that oppressed him in the most significant of ways. And he backed up that dua by forgiving those people forgiving those people that killed his own family, that did things to him when they sought forgiveness, when they uh, came back to the Prophet ﷺ in a different state than the one that they were in before. But the Prophet ﷺ did make dua against tyrants. The Prophet ﷺ did make dua against oppressors. So this is a part of the sunnah too. So it was interesting because in immediately after I tweeted that, I got all sorts of messages, Shaykh, take that down. It's not befitting. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a bad look. And this is... Uh, you know, this is not the sunnah. I'm like, no, it actually is. It is the sunnah sometimes to make dua against people. And so I meant it as a dua against Jordan Peterson. I really did. When you are 
to that level of hard heartedness and evil to where you can say, give them hell to one of the worst tyrants, if not the worst tyrant and fascist in the world. And you know exactly what give them hell means. It means go mow the lawn in Gaza. It means go murder those animals, animals in quotation marks, because that's what they call them in Gaza. And you know that that's going to result in what we're seeing right now, children being pulled out the rubble. There is Israel has done this too many times in the past for us to have any uh, hesitation in knowing that this is exactly what's going to happen right now. It's just more aggressive than before. So when, when you as a person and you, you masquerade in the public as a thoughtful human being, as someone who cares about, you know, uh, people's well-being, as someone who, whatever it is, right, you masquerade in so many different ways as this thoughtful individual, but you put out something so evil, knowing the implications of it, I meant it as a du'a against him. And I believe we should, and this is an important part of our sunnah, make du'a against tyrants. Yes, make du'a for the guidance of people that, you know, uh, that just don't know any better. Make du'a for the guidance, you know, be, have the heart to forgive people. And that's a part as well, right? You have coworkers, maybe you have colleagues that just don't know any better. Talk to them, make du'a that Allah opens their heart, that Allah guides them. It's very hard for us sometimes to, um, to recognize the depths of the ignorance that some otherwise very good people have fallen into. Mm -hmm. But Jordan Peterson knows what he's doing. And mm -hmm. those types of voices know exactly what they're doing. First of all, he's on the payroll of the Daily Wire. So that should, that should have been no secret for, for many, many <laughs> months, mm -hmm. if not years at this point, as to what he was about. Mm -hmm. But when he does that, honestly, um, you know, him and those like him, should be put in their place, should be absolutely put in their place. This is innocent life that we're talking about right now. And uh, we should have very little tolerance for those that have dehumanized the most noble people on earth because the Prophet ﷺ talked about how noble the people on the outskirts of Al-Aqsa are, within Al-Aqsa and the outskirts of Al-Aqsa are. Those are the most noble people on earth right now. Mm -hmm. And we should have no tolerance with rhetoric that dehumanizes them and we should take that to our dua that the voices of evil are silenced mm -hmm. as well that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either show them the error of their ways or that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know uh, do with them as he sees fit mm -hmm. right Amen. so that's a part of the sunnah as well i want to get into this next i want to build a framework here i want it just i don't want to spend too much time on this but i think it's very very important because it dispels a lot of the myths so this is a college a professor uh showing people can go look into look his name up and they can see when muslims conquer jerusalem because this revolves around jerusalem i want to get your quick reaction before i get into my next questions caliph goes okay i want to meet some of the jews living in jerusalem and Sophonius goes, there are no Jews in Jerusalem. And the Caliph goes, what do you mean there's no Jews in Jerusalem? The city is holy to the Jews. How could there be no Jews? And he says, well, us Christians, we pretty much murder them every chance we get. We really hate Jews. In fact, in the war we just did against the Persians, the Jews sided with the Persians. And so we murdered 20,000 Jews in Jerusalem and completely purged the city of its remaining Jewish population. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, no, this is wrong. You can't do this. And so he turns to a convert to Islam, a Jewish convert to Islam, and he says, I need you to find me 80 Jewish families that were willing to volunteer to move to Jerusalem so we can reestablish a Jewish presence in this city. And that's how the Muslims conquered Jerusalem. And that's the stuff that's left out of your history books. What do you think? Often there's this um, misconception, it's Muslims, they hate Jews, they want to annihilate Jews. You hear this uh, rhetoric. Uh, this is our history here. This is not coming from a Muslim. This is a university professor following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when he came with the army of 10,000 strong and he could have obliterated all of the 
pagan Arabs at that time and others, but he said, spread the peace, spread the food. Omar is going, the head of state at that time, and now he actually repopulated. <laughs> this is like, I, I, this blows your mind. Salahuddin Ayyubi came later. He did the same thing, showing mercy. What do you say when you see something like this? Um, Look, I think I think that one of the most exhausting talking points is the conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. It is absolutely nauseating. It's ahistorical. It is um, intentionally ignorant and reductionist. You you just have to completely ignore our history and ignore who we are today to try to make that conflation. So there are historical Jewish communities in the Muslim world that were never annihilated with alhamdulillah. There is a legacy of mercy and justice in Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, as you mentioned. When Muslims came to Jerusalem, uh, even under, you know, after having faced some of the worst brutality that human beings have ever faced. Salah al-Din did not enter Jerusalem after, you know, uh, peaceful behavior towards Muslims and then react in kind. Salah al-Din entered Jerusalem after the Crusades, who literally, you know, roasted people at the stake, burnt them at the stake and ate them, who had, you know, Muslims, uh, Orthodox Christians and Jews massacred by the hundreds of thousands and the blood to the knees of their horses, uh, the, the crimes that were committed against the Muslims and other religious communities are well documented. And the mercy and the magnanimity and the justice that was shown by the likes of Salah al-Din and Ayyubi, rahimahullah, and there's so much more in our Islamic history uh, is well documented. This is, it, it's it's ahistorical, reductionist, ignorant, and the conflation is very much so intentional because uh, it, try, it, it, it tries to remove the criticism of the colonial ethno-fascist state of Israel and turn it into, uh, you know, just Muslims who hate Jews. And that could not be further from the truth. And by the way, some of the most foremost voices for justice for the Palestinians are young Jewish Americans. So it, it just, it, it's all around incoherent and ignorant and reductionist and ahistorical. Uh, you, you can look through our history and you can see many examples, not just, you know, the one that was cited there, even though there's, you know, the way that the professor framed it, uh, there are some, you know, inaccuracies uh, here or there, you know, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu um, returned some of the families that were expelled. So it wasn't just random families. The point being that we have a sense of justice. We have a framework in Islam. Uh, we reject tyranny. No matter what, we reject tyranny. And you know what? We reject it against ourselves as well. And we reject it against our Palestinian brothers and sisters right now as well. And we will speak for them because right now they are in a blackout. They are in a blackout. And everything is being taken away from them. And so they need us. And, and this is sort of, I guess, take it as my parting message. Um, there's a lot of despair. There's a lot of um, hopelessness. It feels like we're getting punched in the face right and left because you turn on the TV and it's infuriating. Uh, you see your favorite celebrity and athlete uh, tweet something idiotic out. It's infuriating. Um, you see the right and the left political establishments somehow find agreement on the dehumanization of the Palestinians, it's exhausting. You see the recreation, or well, it never really went away, the expansion of the surveillance state right now mm -hmm. against the Muslim community, it's exhausting. People are gonna lose their jobs. You have these uh, weird watch lists that, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times any, you know, my university or anywhere else gets contacted by these people. These lists are put together. Uh, you even have the CEO of a large hedge fund right, that is going after anyone who signs a pro-Palestinian letter, an academic letter. Wow. All of this is happening right now. But you know what? We cannot be silent. We can't be silent. And we cannot say that, well, it's too costly to raise our voices right now. Because look what's happening to the Palestinian people right now. 
-hmm. Look what's happening to them. So let's draw from their courage. Let's draw from whatever strength they are mustering up to be able to survive the nights of bombardment with no basic necessities and without the sympathy of the developed world. And let's instead be their voices, inshallah ta'ala. Let's, let's muster up the courage to be able to face whatever consequences come with that. Because every single moment that you're raising awareness, whatever it is, whatever platform, whatever small thing you think you're doing, you're fighting back against this cruel narrative that has very real consequences in real time right now. This is an emergency situation. So we need everyone to make dua. We need everyone to raise awareness in every way that they possibly can. There's a, there's a statement from this uh, person. It was a recent interview with uh, Piers Morgan. He was interviewing Ben Shapiro. And quote, he's saying, only solution is for Israel to annex the Gaza Strip and kill enough of the sons of bitches, he's, is his quote. Anyone who calls for the ceasefire is a terrorist sympathizer. I want to get into this clip and, and get your reaction to it. In one of the videos, you say the only solution is for Israel to annex the Gaza Strip and kill enough sons of bitches to make sure this isn't a problem again. You say anyone who calls for a ceasefire is a terrorist sympathizer under these circumstances. Now, that got a lot of pushback. Uh, I guess this comes to the point of appropriate response. How far do you go? How do you isolate genuine Hamas from perhaps completely innocent Palestinians in Gaza, of which there will be many? Um, one person called you a genocidal warmonger for that rhetoric. And there's a, a, a person called Mohammed Hijab in a video called in responding to Ben Shapiro on Israel. He says this. First and foremost, I'll say, yes, we condemn any woman, child, or whatever it may be that's being killed who's Jewish and who's not a non-combatant. But why is it the case, Ben? Huh? Why is it the case that you, none of your colleagues or you, have been able to offer one single condolence, one single condemnation, one single word of sympathy for any of the Gazans that have been killed. Don't try and smear us. Don't try and slander us. Don't try and attack. Don't try and produce red earrings. And I think you're an ass, a jackass. And we're not talking about Hamas. We're talking about children here. We're talking about women here. We're talking about elderly people. You make me sick. You make me sick. Well, what's your response to that, Ben? I mean, that will be, I'm sure, a reaction you've heard from a lot of people. What do you feel about that? I mean, the, my obvious response is, of course, I feel horrible for the people who are being held by Hamas in a state of tyranny for the past 15 years. Hamas was the elected government in Gaza in 2006. There hasn't been an election since then. Uh, all the people who are who are today ranting, as, as you heard Mohammed Hijab doing right there, I, I don't hear them talking about liberating Gaza from Hamas, which is the greatest threat to the to the way of life of Gazans on planet Earth. Again, I have nothing but sympathy for Hamas, uh, for, for the people that Hamas is is governing or the people that Hamas is exploiting. Really, I have nothing but sympathy for civilians there. Israel has to defend itself. Yeah. I don't understand your your reaction. I mean, everything that Muhammad said to him and more. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, complete, sick, twisted human being. Um, you can see the insincerity right in his eyes. Uh, I think that one of the things that we have to do, you know, is take people back to context. The greatest threat to the Palestinian people is the occupation of the Palestinian people, is the calls for the annihilation of the Palestinian people which has happened uh, through people like Shapiro and his well-funded propaganda machine and others like him that have openly called for genocide. They're not even hiding it anymore. And so I have nothing but sympathy. Okay. I mean, it's, it's very clear that you have uh, something other than sympathy, but you know, why don't Mike, they? Why don't? They, why doesn't Piers Morgan press him on this? Like they, any time a speaker, someone comes on, you know, from the other side, they really yeah. they start off with this. Do you support what Hamas launched? Do you condemn what Hamas did? How many times Israel have committed war crimes? Do you start by asking them to condemn themselves? Have you? You don't. But he's kind of just you know stumbling and he's not being direct. You know, I was. I, it was interesting because I was watching. Um, you know, uh, CNN as uh, 
I was waiting for, um, you know, the remarks of Biden a few days ago, and they were interviewing person after person, um, you know, family after family, um, about the horror of the attacks that came from Gaza. Not a single family from Gaza is being interviewed. And when they finally get a Palestinian on, they immediately go into, do you condemn, do you condemn, do you condemn? Do you condemn what Hamas did? It, you know, they, someone says that I just lost 10 relatives, 15 relatives. We don't have an Iron Dome. We have nowhere to run to. We have absolutely no shelter. We have no humanitarian aid. The basic necessities of life are cut off. And immediately you can see the antagonistic nature of interviewers. Do you condemn? Uh, towards Palestinians. And you can see the dehumanizing rhetoric barely masked, even in you know the voices of people that are supposed to be seasoned media people. They can't even mask their, their hatred, their disdain uh, for the Palestinian people. And they keep playing to, again, these tropes of the Arab Muslim savages. Um, and so when someone talks about, you know, threats to the Palestinian people and, you know, uh, yeah, this is this is the, th the greatest threat to the people of Gaza is this. The greatest threat to the people of the West Bank is this. No, the greatest threat is the illegal occupation and system of apartheid that was imposed upon them. None of this happens if you don't have a people that are forcibly removed from their homes put into, uh, you know, these, these small areas, open air prisons, bombarded routinely, cut off from the rest of the world, stripped of their citizenship and their entire identity. None of this happens if you don't do that to a people. And so, you know, when people talk about vicious cycle, I'm just going to say it like this. The only way to end the vicious cycle is to end the vicious occupation. Any discussion that does not include the ending of the illegal occupation of Palestine is a worthless discussion. Let, 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 me, let me ask you this. Um, here you have an Irish, I believe it's an MP. My question is, how does, are they just more intelligent? Do they have access to more information? You're going to see this short clip. I'm going to get your reaction to it. But how do people in certain Congresses, Senates, are they deprived of what this man is informed to? If I was Jewish, and I'd never stepped foot in Israel, I could claim citizenship there tomorrow. But six million people whose origins are in what you now call Israel, who were forced out in 1947 or 48, do not have that right. Isn't that part of the reason why the Palestinians are in dispute with Israelis? Because you deny them the right to return to their homes and to their land and to their villages, and that they have a legitimate claim, even under international law, to return, but you deny them that right. Why do you deny them that right? And why do you give that right to other people who have no connection whatsoever with the land, whether you call it Israel or whether you call it Palestine? Why do you continue to seize land if you're serious about Oslo and the two-state solution, which under that agreement is land designated to be Palestinian land? 500,000 people, most of which has taken place since Oslo. You allow that to happen. Why do you allow it to happen? If you're serious about giving this land to the Palestinians, it's absolutely extraordinary. Are you not just taking us, Ambassador, for idiots that you can say with a straight face, we're serious about peace, but while we're serious about peace, we're going to seize Palestinian land. And you expect the Palestinians to just sit back and do nothing about that. Now, you know what the Palestinian people have been asking for, far less even than some people would ask for. Because I believe the whole apartheid system should be dismantled. But what they've asked for is to lift the siege of Gaza. Just to lift the siege of Gaza. Let them have an airport. Let them have uh, ports. Let them not be dictated to by a government for whom they do not vote as to what can go in and out of their territories, whether they will have power, whether they will have clean water, whether they will have medicine. What makes you think you're allowed to have nuclear weapons and the fourth biggest army in the world and visit destruction on the, the people of Gaza, but they have no right to defend themselves? They have no territorial sovereignty over I, the, that land. Would you ask questions, please? Have they all their own? How do you justify that? Yeah. All right. How do you justify those uh, double standards? Very lastly, Ambassador, people like uh, Bishop Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and I would certainly describe your state as a uh, apartheid state with different laws for people depending on their race or religion. For example, at checkpoints going into the West Bank, there's a channel if you're Israeli or European, and there's a channel.
because you're Arab. Just because you're Arab. If you came into Dáil Éireann and they stopped you and said, are you Jewish? Oh no, sir, you can't come in through the same entrance uh, as Irish people or European people because you're Jewish. You would call that racism and apartheid. You practice that with your checkpoints and your military okay. uh, barriers and your apartheid wall. How can you justify is he is he getting intel that they're not? I I don't uh, I, I don't no, understand. He's, they, using, I, he's using common sense mm -hmm. and he's speaking with common dignity. Um, just it's foundational dignity um, that unfortunately is lacking from the discourse in the United States. And and let's be real here. I mean, I, I want to say two things here. Number one, um, you know, on a personal level, um, my parents are both Palestinian refugees. They were both expelled from their homes. My parents actually met in the United States. I'm in the process. I've been trying to translate the poetry that my mother, may Allah have mercy on her, used to write I about mean, Palestine. I've posted some of it um, and about Bosnia as well. You know, I've spoken to you about that, um, you know, because we grew up with that in the background also and just the oppressed peoples. I've never been to my parents' homeland. I've never been allowed entry. Uh, into my ancestral homes. I've never been able to go and visit my relatives. There are people there that I love as if I've grown up with uh, with them. And I've only known them through Zoom and FaceTime. And I'm, I'm grateful to Allah for that, that we at least have that level of connection because obviously our parents used to have, you know, the occasional letter writing. But the fact that people can be forcibly removed from their homes and someone from Long Island, New York, you are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No! You know, can, can walk into a home in Jerusalem where you have a generational family occupancy and throw them out with absolutely no repercussions. In fact, with the full cover of the IOF, um, with the full cover of the entire security apparatus of Israel, um, if that's not outrageous, to any human being, any human being, I'm not even talking about faith now. I'm just talking about basic dignity, basic humanity. If that does not enrage you, you have to actually analyze and assess your own humanity at this point. If that does not enrage you, that, that someone who has absolutely no connection to this home can take a first class ticket over and throw families out of their homes and Here's the thing, and this is what I want to end on. You, you talk about two sets of information. You talk about the, um, you know, so, sort of the polarization that's taking place now, right? So you can see if you watch media in some countries, it's like you're you're looking at as if you're looking at two different regions. It, it mm -hmm. makes no sense, right? But here's what we also have to be very honest with: these tactics are the exact same tactics that tactics that the United States government used in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Mm -hmm the dehumanizing of entire populations and erasing their stories from the American public. And, you know, with the hundreds and thousands of casualties, ask an American to name you one victim of the Iraq war. They can't, they can't because they're not people anymore. They were wiped out in the name of security, in the name of security, completely wiped out populations. And the terror that was inflicted in the quote unquote war on terror on innocent populations that were again framed as savages, Arab Muslim savages with all of these tropes. Mm -hmm. This is the exact same rhetoric and the exact same framing that I got, used against the Palestinian people. I got two more questions and we're going to conclude. I want to, because uh, most uh, Americans, we know as Muslims, we would never do something like this. I mean, this is something, but let alone Americans uh, are not found of sending three point some billion uh, of their taxpaying money to go ahead. And now, as you can see, uh, this is from a Hamza Zorsis um, talking about this siege where you have 2 million people, you have 50%, if I'm not um, mistaken, are children. So this is something where the American public, the American taxpayers, you know, when you look look into this now, do they really want to starve a people to death? I mean, these are, these are not animals. But with that being said, nothing, nothing, nothing like what is being done to the people of Gaza right now, what is being done to the people of Gaza right now is, 
Inhumane is not even a word for it. Targeted attacks on civilian infrastructure with a clear aim to cut off men, women, children of water, electricity and heating with the winter coming. These are acts of pure terror and we have to call it as such. And, and the, the sad thing is, is that you have people that otherwise might seem like reasonable, um, normal people that are somehow justifying this. I'm not talking about the Ben Shapiro's and the Jordan Peterson's of the world. I'm talking about just normal people that you expect better from, uh, that, that somehow have been manipulated to the point that they believe that this is okay to starve off an entire population, over 1 million children. And you've got TikTok videos being made by Israeli settlers mocking the thirst of the Palestinians. Um, guys putting their faces next to faucets and uh, showing off the plentiful supply of water, knowing that there are babies that will die from not having access to water, not because of a drought due to some sort of natural uh, disaster occurrence, but due to the intentional shutting off of water from a sick and demented regime. And that's the only way that, that you can describe them, sick and demented. We're, we're done. We're out of time. We're going to end with this. I want people to imagine themselves in the situation where you have complete buildings with civilians in them being destroyed, families being annihilated, a complete genocide happening. But if you look at some of these videos, people, they're hearing some Arabic being said, and you continue, and I'll end with this video, the people still keep praising the Most High, the Creator of the heavens and earth. <laughs> what lesson can can we take from that shay The fact that these people can say Alhamdulillah is, uh, <clears throat> I just want you to think about that as, as you complain about anything happening in your life. You know, I, <clears throat> yeah, Alhamdulillah. All you can say is Alhamdulillah. The fact that they can say Alhamdulillah with all that happening is, um, is a great sign of Iman. It's a miracle of faith. And I just hope that, you know, a lot of times we become disconnected in our, um, <clears throat> We become entirely disconnected from from these people, and when you forget Allah, you forget yourself, and you forget other people. Um, <clears throat> you know, the last conversation that I had with um, a distant cousin of mine uh, before his his I don't know what happened to his phone. I just said, you know, akfiru min qawli la ilaha illallah. Just um, keep saying la ilaha illallah immediately. La ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah. The fact that these people still say alhamdulillah and la ilaha illallah. It is, it is nothing short of a miracle, and it puts us to shame in our own lives. So be inspired by the people of Gaza as well. Thank you very much. May um, the creator of the heavens and earth, God Almighty Allah, bless you and help all those who are suffering and reward you. And Jazakallah. Thank you. Our brother in Islam, Eddie from the Dean Show, is creating the Dean Center, which is a masjid and a dawah center, which is going to help non-Muslims learn about Islam, inshallah. And the most beautiful thing about this is that we can all be a part of this. We can all take part in earning rewards from this simply by donating whatever we can to make this a reality, which is beautiful. Let's do that. All right, let's click this link, let's donate what we can, and let's make this a reality, inshallah.
cannot leave without giving you a gift. If you're not yet Muslim and you're tuning in to see what these Muslims are talking about and you like a free copy of the Quran, go ahead and visit thedeanshow.com. We'll take care of the postage and everything and get it delivered to you. And if you still have some questions about Islam, call us at 1-800-662-4752. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu